Finance. Hey, welcome everyone to the Financial Independence Podcast, the podcast where I get inside the brains of some of the best and brightest in personal finance to find out how they achieved financial independence. On today's show, I'm really excited to introduce a lot of guests. Back when I was in Stratford upon Avon last year for the UK Chautauqua, I had the pleasure of sitting around a table with Vicky Robin, author of Your Money, Your Life, and a lot of other really interesting people. And the way this came about is Vicky is releasing a new version of Your Money, Your Life. And to coincide with that release, she's also created a game called Money Talks. And what it is, is it's a series of 52 cards, just like a deck of cards. But on each card, there's money topics. And the idea is that this will help promote talking about money with your friends and family and maybe broaching subjects that you wouldn't otherwise talk about. So when she told me about this idea early in the week, I thought that would be an amazing thing to try to do at the Chautauqua. And it would be even better if I could record it and then release it as a podcast. So that's exactly what we did. On the last day in Stratford, we all sat around the table, broke out the Money Talks cards, had a few beers, and had an amazing conversation about many different money topics. And that's what I'm sharing with you today. So without further delay, here is Money Talks live from Chautauqua, UK, with Vicky Robin, author of Your Money or Your Life, and Chautauqua attendees Eduardo, Laura, Brandon, version 2, Matt, Lena, Kimmy, Jason, Megan, Ollie, and Shane. And those last two guys didn't actually participate in the talk, but they did bring me beer for the talk, so they both definitely deserve a shout out. So thank you for that. And a big thank you to everyone who participated. It was a lot of fun, and it was great to listen back to when I was editing it. So I hope you enjoy it. We are in Eddington Park for the UK Chautauqua. And we've been here all week, and it's been an incredible week, and we're going to do something special for you today. I am going to pass over to a super special guest, Vicki Robin, author of Your Money, Your Life, and she's going to tell us what we're doing today. Hi, everybody. Yeah, one of the innovations I've done for the makeover of Your Money, Your Life that comes out uh, March 2018 is to develop a set of questions that people can ask themselves in their journal or ask their mates or you know, in a group of people or open up in a workplace or have a conversation in a meetup, uh, a way for people to talk to other people about our thoughts and feelings and strategies around money. It's not about advice. It's just simply learning together because the, what we all need to know is not necessarily embedded in the experts. Of course, it's you, Brandon, but, but it's embedded in other people. It's just we have to know how to unlock it. So these are questions that to unlock the conversations we really want to have about money in our daily lives. And the rules of the game really are that we're going to go around the circle once and very brief opening comment, a minute, maximum 90 seconds. Just we'll have a topic. Brandon will introduce it and you all will just say, here are some of my thoughts on it. And then we'll go around one more time with no crosstalk, no feedback. And you can deepen your own comment. You can say what I really meant to say or another thought I have, or you could have heard something that somebody across the table said, and you can, oh, that makes me think about. So basically what we're doing is it's like finger painting. We're squeezing a lot of colors out here in a collective art piece. And then we're going to open it up and just talk and see where the conversation goes. And everybody has a question card face down in front of them, which is their intervention. Like if the conversation is getting dribbling into meaninglessness or somebody's over talking at any moment, no shame, no blame, no judgment. You can just flip over your uh, question card and change the subject. And we've never done this before. So we're going to find out how it works. Yeah. Very excited. So uh, thank you guys all for being here. Um, so yeah, this is something different from anything we've done before on the podcast. I'm really excited about it. So Crack open a cold beer, which I will do right now, thanks to Shane, who brought beer all the way to England from Texas. So I got a Hopadillo IPA from Carbach Brewery. So, And I just spilled beer all over my laptop, but uh, <laughs> but that's all right. Uh, we will find a napkin. And um, So uh, before we start, just want to go around the circle so everyone can introduce themselves, and then we'll just kick right in. So here you go. Thanks, Brandon. i um, hoping your laptop isn't too broken. Um, yeah, so my name is Eduardo. Uh, Originally from Brazil, live in the UK. Um, been following this stuff for a few years, and very glad that I came to Chautauqua. If any of you are thinking about going to the next one, um, yeah, it's an amazing week, amazing group of people, amazing conversations. Uh, definitely not just about the speakers, even though they're amazing. The conversations you have with the other the other guests are what makes the week special. So yeah, looking forward to this game. 
Hi, my name's Laura. I'm from uh, London, UK, so I didn't have to travel as far as everybody else, just an hour down the road. So yeah, I've, I've been following the Mad Scientist for a long time now, so I'm, I'm really excited to, to take part in this. Hi, I'm Kimmy. I'm from Brazil, but I live in California. Uh, I've come here to the UK. It's been an amazing week, highly recommended. Um, and let's see what this game is all about. My name is Matt. I'm from Leeds, England. Uh, like Laura, I've not had to travel too far either. Um, I've been a convert from the Mad Scientist podcast for probably about five years now, which has got me really interested in this space. And the amount of laughter we've had this week and meeting like-minded people has been the real game changer for me. Yeah, my name is uh, Brandon. I'm from um, Minneapolis in the US. And this week has been incredibly inspiring, not just because of the speakers, but um, all of the people that I've gotten to to spend time with. And um, I discovered Fi about two and a half years ago. And so, um, man, like, uh, I was inspired then, I thought, but now uh, I'm even more inspired. So really looking forward to this game and um, glad to have been here. Hi, uh, this is Jason from San Diego, and I'm just going to say ditto. Everybody else pretty much stole my lines. Um, this has been incredible, and uh, I'm just going to keep passing it on here. Hello, my name is Lena, and um, I'm pretty much at the beginning of my FI journey, and so I'm really looking forward to having this talk together with you. Great, and you obviously know Vicky, so um, yeah, this is great. So I'm going to start off with an easy one. Um, obviously, we're going to get deeper, I'm sure, but this will be uh, at least something to get us going. What uh, Talk about your biggest money mistake and what would you do differently um there's there've been several um <laughs> hopefully none of them derailed me too far off the so i'm still on the path thankfully um i'd say one of them was uh leasing a car when i didn't have to eventually kind of i think uh, you think it's a good deal they make it look good um but just the just the money leaving your bank account every month i just did not like that so that's that was a lesson learned um wouldn't do that again buying lots and lots of pointless things sl- small values they add up over time they compound um, just getting rid of all of that waste, all of that inefficient spending, probably one of the biggest lessons I've learned. So lots of little things add up to one big mistake. I'd say that's probably the, the biggest thing. Um, so yeah, like Eduardo, probably probably too many to count, I imagine. Um, but I, I think the it, it all adds up. And um, I think it's the things where you spend and actually you don't like what you've bought or you think you wanted it and you get it home and you don't. I think they're the biggest mistakes. They're not necessarily the things I spent the most money on. Um, they might have been of, of a lot of value. And actually, I'm, I'm glad I spent the money, but it's the things that I, I didn't really think through. Um, for me, it was definitely... Uh, taking too long and being too unsure about getting into the stock market. I felt uh, I came from a different country to the US and it felt a little unsettling for me. So uh, eventually I got, I summed up courage and I bought a single stock and I watched it go up and down and I'm like, I'm going to get comfortable with this because I need to get comfortable with this. So I bought a single stock, watched it for about I would say four months until I was okay and I was fine to finally put money in the market. But had I done it before, this conversation would be moved. I would just be here and financial independent much, much uh, way before I am today. I think the big one for me has been a car. Uh, I was a former professional soccer player, so it was always the competition to have the best car in the car park, and it just became a way of life. That was normal. So like Eduardo, having a car payment just became normalized. And once you can free yourself from that, it's so liberating and then obviously frees you up the money to invest uh, and dive right in. I was fortunate that I discovered saving and investing in 2008. So I bought a lot of my things on sale. So <laughs> I'm one of the lucky ones. Um, I, I would say for me, um, it's really it was really just um, understanding the value of money in my life. I think my big mistake was thinking that like, you, you know, I get my paycheck I pay the bills and everything that's left over is what I have to spend. And that was my understanding of money. I, I didn't know there was that it was really a tool um, that I could use. So I just um, I wish I could have realized that earlier. I think my biggest mistake was, I'm going to say, quote unquote, believing the advice I was given when I first started uh, saving and investing through 401ks and stuff through my employer. The average advice was, oh, if you can save 5%, five, 5%, you're doing great. And if you can save 10%, that's amazing. And, uh, you know, in the fire community, that's kind of like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> you know, <laughs> pat you on your head. So, you know, so for me, the biggest mistake was, you know, as probably almost everybody says at some point, man, I wish I'd been able to start bigger sooner. I had actually two mistakes I did. First, uh, it's like Brennan. I got the money at the beginning of it every month and I would just spend everything. I never really like ran out of money and went into the red. It was just, I would spend down every single cent. And now I just 
think that was kind of dumb. Um, and the second thing I did, um, I did get some money invested in stocks, but I bought mutual funds and I just realized about a year ago that this was not very smart. So I pulled out the money. Yeah, what occurred to me is as we were going around the table, and it's it's sort of an odd mistake, maybe not, but I actually put a lot of emotion into the things I buy. I mean, like my, I can't get rid of stuff in my closet because I can remember every purchase and where I was and who was there. So there's probably a lot of shopping mistakes in my closet that I just don't get rid of. Uh, but uh, I was a co-owner of a, a house that where we had a lot of people living together in this house in Seattle and, and people started to move away and other people moved in. There was a point that it was the top of the housing market in Seattle, but I had a, had a, an affectionate relationship with a, a couple that was living there and I didn't want to disturb them so I wouldn't sell the house. And so when they finally wanted to move, that was time to, and that was the bottom of the housing market in Seattle. So, I mean, it's pitiful because I did go on Zillow recently and the house is worth twice what it was. But nonetheless, I'm having a happy life. So mine was my wife, well, then girlfriend at the time, we bought a house in Scotland and we did it up over two and a half years and sold it in 2007 for like over 50% th than what we bought it for just before the whole world collapsed. So we sold it and then I was so excited because I've always wanted a portfolio to manage. I always wanted money. I wanted to invest and all this stuff. So, but I didn't know what I was doing. So we looked on the internet for like a financial advisor. We just picked like the top one on Google or something, called him up. He came over and he pretty much picked the funds that would pay him the most, but had previously returned the best uh, return, which obviously the past doesn't predict the future. Um, so we went into that and he like, he treated us like big time people. We were in our mid to no, early twenties, I think early twenties. And he's like, Oh yeah, we'll go on the golf course. And I was like, wow, I'm a big shot now. Like, yeah, golfing with my financial advisor. And then it was only uh, a few years later after obviously 2008 happened. So then everything cut in half pretty much instantly after we put it in there and I couldn't get it out because they had ridiculously high fees to withdraw it within the first five years. And that's when I learned to never trust anyone else with your money. Yeah, so um, mine will probably be uh, res resisting index funds for too long. I had a, I think my ego was telling me I could actually pick stocks. Um, once you have a few winners, you really do believe the, you know, your own story, I guess, your own hype. Um, but then uh, you read the the the, uh, the studies and all the math and everything, and not to mention the amount of time that you save. So yeah, index funds all the way. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Jim Collins is smiling. JL Collins and H uh, dot com is smiling in the corner, so he's giving a thumbs up. <laughs> So this one is going to get real deep real quick. Um, so at the Chautauqua, uh, each of the speakers uh, give a presentation and it's always shocking when they give a presentation because you expect them to talk about something else like Christy and Bryce from Millennial Revolution, they're here and you would expect, you know, travel, geographic arbitrage, those types of things, not buying a house, all of that. Um, but then they talk about something deeper and it, that's actually what I did too. I'm sure everyone here imagined I would talk about tax avoidance or something like that. And uh, actually I didn't. And it's funny that pretty much every talk uh, touched on similar things. And it all boils down to sort of this question, <laughs> what is your calling, the work of your heart and soul? Well, I get this one first, I guess, because I'm supposed to have thought about it more. <laughs> this is Vicky again. You know, at some level, it's just making people happy so that I'm living in a happy world. It, it, that's a really simple way to say it. But, but um, I'm like 72 now. I've been around in this body for a long time. And I, and I finally realized that I don't have to do everything. Uh, my issue doesn't have to be the most important issue. What I really love doing is using my skills and talents and networks to make a specific difference in the lives of people I love. Uh, and I love a lot of people. So sometimes I choose big projects. To be honest, I don't really know at this point because, um, I'm just, trapped in the in the red race right now and i do what i have to do afterwards i i do what i want of course but it's nothing really soul searching or something where i say oh that would make me happy beyond everything i've ever done so i think one of the things that we can really buy with money and with the fi journey is that we can really have the time to focus on what we're good at what we want to do in life what we want to achieve and how we want to be happy in the end. So I'm going for it. My grandfather basically advocates the campsite rule, but for the whole world. 
Um, and that always resonated with me. And so my, my goal is to leave the world a little better than I found it. Um, and I really think that helping spread the word about FI, especially the RE is kind of optional, but at least the FI part of things. Um, so I would like to help spread the word and even more importantly, um, help people figure out what they need to do to get there. Um, you know, whether it's one-on-one small groups, you know, conferences, whatever. And that, that's the kind of thing that definitely moves my soul. It makes me, it makes me uh, get some fire in the blood. This is a super hard question. And, um, I think, you know, a lot of us and, and have spent a lot of time trying to answer this question. And I, I don't know for me that, that there is an answer. So I reject your question. <laughs> um, and I will insert my own context of how I think this uh, should go. And I think that there are uh, there is purpose to be found in many things um, for many people. And, you know, that's something that I've kind of maybe um, learned hints of uh, coming up to the Chautauqua. But I've definitely it's been solidified through some talks. And I don't remember whose talk it was, but um, it was almost specifically mentioned. And I think it was like, you know, I'm a business analyst, but you know, when I was seven, people weren't like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, Psh, I want to be a business analyst, <laughs> you know? Um, however, um, I'm not unhappy uh, with my career. And I, I love being a business analyst and I love the work that I do. And I find purpose in, in what I do. Um, and I think that, you know, business analysis is not the only thing I can find purpose in. I think there's a lot of things I can find purpose in. Um, and then so, um, that is the answer to my own question. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all acknowledge that FI is a route to fulfill your dreams, your passions, um, what you've always wanted to do. And I think the, the difficult thing for me is that the two things I always wanted to do when I was younger was play professional soccer and be a journalist. And I've played professional soccer and now I do journalism. So, and I'm 37. So it's what else is there? And I, I don't know if there's necessarily one thing or one passion or one dream. Millennium Revolution guys were talking this morning that you've almost got another six or seven lives if you live for another 50, 60 years. And I think that's the most exciting thing that part of the excitement is maybe not knowing. I think calling um, comes, it changes over life. It changes as you mature. And for me, it has de definitely changed. Uh, for me, I would say that when I was younger, my calling was a lot closer to my survival skills. So it was being very good at my job. It was being able to provide for myself. It was uh, being able to make money and be free. And so I've always looked for freedom, but through this fulfillment, I think that has changed as I matured. And today I seek a lot more community. So I look at, I look for impact and I look for community in some sense, uh, whether it's smaller or bigger. So definitely removing the survival with the not needing money anymore and removing the survival from the, from the list has allowed me to go for a deeper purpose of having community. I don't know if my calling now will be my calling later, but, um, I'm, I'm not FI yet. I'm about to drop down to part time work. So I get to have a bit more time to explore some things. Um, and what I'd really like to do is, uh, I'd like to help kids to read. So I'd like to go into a school. Um, because I think if I couldn't read, I wouldn't have found blogs. I wouldn't have found FI. I wouldn't have found you lovely people. You know, I think it opens up such a world of possibilities to people if they can actually read. So I would really like to spend some time and then, and then see where that goes. So I've had the most time to think about this, but I probably still don't really know the answer. <laughs> um, but I've, I have been thinking about this, to this, this topic more recently in my life and um, haven't narrowed it down, but I do know that there's something to do with being outside, being active, bringing financial education to younger people is something that I'm quite passionate about. The fact that we don't learn that at school, I think is criminal almost. Um, being healthy, so mi somehow mixing all of those things together, I think will bring me a lot of fulfillment in my life. And I'm looking forward to narrowing that down a lot further and finding out exactly what it is, but I'm sure it's something along those lines. So I have a bit of an unfair advantage um, because yeah, my whole talk was sort of talking about how you know you need something to retire to and that too that you retire to needs to be big enough to keep you happy and take the place of your job. So I've thought long and hard about it and I reflected on some of the most rewarding things I've done in my life and the most rewarding things I've created and for me, it sort of boiled down to, you know, working hard at something to get better at it in order to create something that helps as many people as possible 
myself included. So, you know, happy life and creation and mastery. And that that's what mine all boil down to. And uh, thank you for Ollie for the, the delivery of Guinness. So thank you. <laughs> you got your you got yourself on the podcast. <laughs> so now we're going to open it up and we're going to chat about maybe something someone else said that you wanted to add to or comment on or if you wanted to dive a little bit deeper into a certain topic. So um, I'm going to open it up. Anyone want to jump in? Yeah, Kimmy. I think that's something uh, Eduardo said about uh, teaching financial uh, knowledge, right? I think that a lot of us, there's so much myth and there's so much taboo around money. We don't talk about it enough. We don't talk about it openly enough. So we always feel inadequate whenever we're talking and we are approaching money. And this is something that I would like to kind of debunk. It's something that I think we should all. Um, and thank you so much for you, to you, Brandon, and to everybody who talks openly about it, shares information because I think it's the essential thing so that we look at it and we're like okay it's not unattainable it's not a myth we can all get there I think this week has, has, has opened everybody's eyes on the on on at the Chautauqua that when we're at home and, and we're following this path we feel like the odd one's out and finally we found our people I think that's been the three words from this week we found our people um, that we're not alone and we're not worrying about um, the odd thing. We're all worrying about the same things. And actually, that it's not the minu minutiae that we're worrying about really makes no difference. In the grand scheme of things, with with the savings rate and simple investing will allow us to achieve whatever we want to achieve. And I think in your talk, that was almost the massive fundamental question and probably takes a bit more than a podcast to answer. <laughs> So how do you how do you talk with your people you in your real life? Because I know I spoke to Ollie, who is the man that just delivered the Guinness. Thank you again. Um, uh, and he said something really interesting. He's like he, he's like I share it with everyone I know because if any of my friends knew about this, and I found myself learning about it ten years after they actually hit phi, and here I am just like working paycheck to paycheck, possibly like I was, I would be really angry with them and sad that they didn't just share that journey with me early. And that's something that hit home with me because I don't like talking about it in real life um, with people I know because I feel like, one, I'm either, they feel like I'm judging them. Uh, two, I feel like I'm bragging about my financial standing. And it's just very difficult. So does anyone here around the table talk to their friends and family? And if so, how does that, um, how do you do it in a way that you don't have any of those negative consequences. Um, I think I think I've been probably talking about it in the wrong way up till now. Um, so I, I've been trying to sort of almost simplify it down um, for people to say I, I want to retire early. And and actually, I think a lot of people are, are very stunned by that. But then it comes back to this whole: well, what are you going to do afterwards? Or I really like my job, so why would I want to retire? And actually, I, I think I need to actually change the way that I'm talking about it because. I've been trying to simplify it down, but in that way, I think I've actually been isolating people away from it and probably not explaining it very well. So um, I think I'm going to talk a lot more about how it's it's much more about um, f getting freedom and then finding purpose. Um, and some people may think that's a bit deep and, and not really be interested in it, but, but maybe it will just invoke a few more interesting conversations rather than just, well, I like my job, so I'm not going to do it. And to just kind of extend on that just a little bit, um, what so i haven't really been talking about it with uh, people other than my like, like my closest friends and family um but i'm thinking about talking about it more and more um hopefully we'll see but what i'm thinking is a really good hook to get people interested is to sort of point out the you know no job is guaranteed one of the talks kind of went into well you know you could get a new boss. The company could get purchased by another company. That has happened to me multiple times at this point. Um, and a really good job turns into way less of a good job. Or, you know, you get let go as, uh, even Jim has had happen to him once. You know, you never know what's going to happen. So having the, um, protection of a runway of a few years, you know, basically the uh, FU money concept, even if it, you don't need to say FU, having it there is such a comfort. Um, it lets you take some more risks at work, which will actually probably work out in your benefit. Um, so I'm thinking of like, if I can word it that way, people who initially will be like, well, I like my job. I don't really need to worry about this. You know, then if you can sell them on some other options, you know, that's a great way as, like I said, sort of the hook to get them interested and the numbers, they're important. Of course, I'm not trying to say they're not, but that's sort of more mechanics and plug and chug and figure out your risk and a few other details that, you know, can come later when they're like, Oh, great. Teach me more. You know, what plugs should I read or whatever? Yeah, so I've obviously spent many years talking about this to people um, with this, almost a missionary zeal because I really 
I wanted to liberate people from feeling like they had no choice. And I also have, was really passionate. I am passionate about unhooking people from a consumer society, a throwaway society. And I'll tell you, you know, if you just talk about your passion for, like, if you talk about children, if you talk about financial literacy for children, like, I'm passionate about that. I think our kids are being brought up in a too commercial culture. And so I'm doing this experiment for myself because I, I really want to unhook and I want to help other people unhook. That actually goes down like honey because everybody knows we're hooked. Um, and the other thing I found is, is personal story. You know, it's like if you just tell somebody, you know, it's a basic, I once was lost, but now I'm found story. It's, you doesn't have to sound that religion, but it, religious, but you know, at a certain point in my life, something happened and I realized and that changed so much for me. And here are some of the ways I'm happier from that process. I will also say, I just want to throw in that, as Jason said, we have this term FIRE, financial independence, retire early. Retire early is maybe a little, but then if we talk about financial independence, I want to be freer. I want to be freer of debt. I want to be free, you know, everybody wants to be freer. And so, and this is how I'm going about it. And actually I want to be totally free, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just saying that, um, it's a very human thing. People, people really want to hear your story and, and they don't want to be marketed to, and they don't want to be convinced. They just, but they, you tell a story and it lets them rehearse it in themselves. I think it's a British culture, maybe not to share anything. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I think it's a taboo subject, uh, probably the the most taboo subject talking about money. So it's it's quite a delicate thing to talk to people about. And if you've got a group of friends or you make the most money out of that group, then you can sound preachy and people can say, "Oh, well, you can do it because you earn this much and I don't earn this much." And 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 it's decoupling the amount of money to which will allow you to reach that freedom to find something else. Um, I, even if you're a teacher, you can, st if you can still do it, you could just end up going teaching in other countries. Um, a bit like Laura said, helping people of less advantage to, uh, to get on in life. And I think that's a really noble thing. Um, and one thing I think is important and it's interesting because we talked about it before is also share, sharing your mistakes. So by exposing yourself and by saying, Hey, this is what happens or this is what happened to me when I was down. So, Hey, I failed here and I was down and this happened and now I'm better. So I'm, I'm finally found is also something that I think connects you to people because even though you are exposing yourself and you need a slight thicker skin to be able to expose yourself, you are providing this information, not from a, a standpoint that, Hey, I'm financially independent. It's so great. And it's here where the clouds are beautiful. It's not about that. It's about being on the ground, being in the trenches. Everybody's in the trenches. We need to go down with them and say, hey, I was there. I was below that. And this would happen to me. And I think then you open a connection and you are able to talk to. So being able to be open, expose yourself is a big thing to get the empathy. Yeah, going back to Matt's point, one of the biggest things that I, one big eye openers I had was uh, learning the whole savings rate table because that's percentages, right? So it doesn't really matter how much you make. It's, it's a percentage of your take-home pay. So if people can get their heads around that, it's, it's really powerful as well. Yeah, I love percentages. That's the best way to go about it. Brandon, you had something to say? Um, I, I think when, when Vicky was originally talking, it made me think of, um, we, we have, during the Chautauqua, we've brought up a bunch of times office space. And, you know, um, we talk about like the, con you know, the concept of FU money and just, you know, being able to just say like, well, I don't, don't want to do that anymore. Like I'm going to, I'm going to walk away. And it's not just that, but it's like that confidence that the FU money gives you. It, it, it can, you know, almost change you as a person into a better person. And so the office space references, um, you know, when Peter, um, you know, he gets hypnotized and then he just has this like realization. He's like, yeah, actually, I don't, I don't really care about my job or like, you know, how well I do or the promotion or the, I don't care about the money, like nothing, you know? And he, uh, he walks into the meeting with the bobs and he's just like, you know, he goes in, he's like, pours himself a glass of water, like puts his feet up. He's like, what's going on guys? You know? And, uh, they start asking him questions like, you know, well, what about this? You've been missing a lot of work. And he's like, well, I wouldn't say I've been missing it, Bob. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it, it's that confidence. And uh, um, Chris uh, Hardwick has a great quote about confidence. And he says, confidence is about um, having options. And, you know, having that FU money is like all you have all of the options. Um, and, and that's where, you know, you, you know, the, the freedom 
that Phi brings you Phi brings you that freedom to to choose whatever option you want. So yeah, this is all great stuff. I think we're gonna like move into the round where we just uh pick out the wild card in front of us. So that was just randomly shuffled through this deck. I jumped it. So let's see. Uh wild card. Mine is talk about an early memory of money and how it affects you now. Um so I actually have one that comes right up on this. So God mom, I apologize. <laughs> so I was I was probably about 13 and my dad lost his job. Uh, my parents were not massively overextended, but they had like a house and a boat and, you know, just kind of the normal things that you accumulate as typical adults these days in a middle class setup. And he couldn't get a new job for a couple of years. Just, it was just rough times. And I watched them suffer, be stressed about it, be unhappy about it. They were very good at keeping the fighting away from me and my sister. That was pretty, pretty, uh, I don't know how the whole heck they pulled that off, but. Um, but it really made an impression on me because, you know, teenagers, that's kind of like the time that happens. And I kind of, I still kind of remember vaguely the, oh, this is what not to do. So luckily for me, that taught me very early on, never, ever, 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 ever spend beyond your means and don't go into debt for pretty much anything. Um, obviously, you know, later I learned houses, cars, oops on the cars. There's one, mis- one more mistake, but, um, that, that's for me, kind of like one of my earliest financial memories. Um, also mom, sorry. <laughs> uh, but I think one of my earliest financial memories are that I wanted, I've always been somewhat of a rebel and I wanted to do things my way. And my mother, very strong woman, very, very strong woman. And she would look at me and say, well, that's all fine and dandy, but you live in this house. I pay for everything. When you have your money, you can do things your way. You're not 18. You're going to be here and you're going to abide by my rules because all of this is provided by me. And I'm like, okay, great. So at 13, I found my first job and I've been working ever since because I looked at it and I said, okay, so if that's about money, I'll get my money and I'll start being my own boss as soon as I can. So it's pretty powerful, but then it puts you in some situations, right? Yeah. I I remember when I was a kid, I mean, my mom's the strongest woman I know. Um, apart from my wife, obviously, <laughs> but better get that one in there. Um, um, I know, yeah. and I, I remember when, when she came home one day when I was, a, when I was a kid and she'd lost her job and she was in tears and there was just me and her, but she, she found a way to, to get another job. And she has been so disciplined with money. She was always found a way to save, even though she never earned a lot of money. And I think that sticks with you, even if it's not obvious it's in your subconscious. And that's probably one of the reasons why I'm here. Uh, so during the week, Vicky told me a really interesting story about her relationship with money, uh, her earliest relationship with money. And I, I, I thought it was pretty fascinating. So I was wondering if she would share that with us. You're outing me. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is on an early memory about money. And um, I lived in an upper middle class family. And so I just never saw any transactions. Actually, I just never saw transactions happening. Uh, it was all a mystery. And so I didn't actually know that things cost money. I was very young. And I was totally into my dolls. And I had a Ginny doll, which is like precursor, but more realistic of a Barbie doll. And I love dressing my Ginny doll. I had a whole suitcase full of clothes for my Ginny doll. And I made clothes for my Ginny doll. And <laughs> and then my brother told me that if we cut through the back um, hedge, that we could go down an embankment and we could go over to a part of town I'd never been in because I never went anywhere. Uh, but it was sort of like a rough part of town, but it had a toy store. So I, I sneak down and I go down and I go in the toy store and I, they had all this Ginny doll clothes. And so I'm like, I'm like really excited because there's a little coat and there's a little party dress. And there's, a, so I stack up about seven boxes of Ginny doll clothes and I just walk out. <laughs> Because I didn't know about the the money part of it, and somebody stopped me on my way out. I was like, oh, I was so ashamed and embarrassed and perplexed, and, and so that's all I remember of it. Yeah, that's the secret to FI. You just steal everything, and then <laughs> you don't have to worry about money. It's great. It's the best. So we actually have a new surprise guest. So Eduardo had to go and call in for work from UK should talk. <laughs> So now we have Megan, so please introduce yourself. Um, I'm, I'm Megan. Uh, I'm from the Boston area. I'm, me and my husband are here at the Chautauqua Ali, the, the beer bringer of beer. Uh, and we're from the Boston area, and we're both teachers. Poor, poor teachers. How could we ever achieve uh, FI? We've been, on, on the, uh, we've been subscribers to the cult for about five years. 
<laughs> now and uh, kind of halfway along our journey to FI. Awesome. Well, welcome. So we're nearing the end. So we uh, just dish- dished out a new wild card for everyone. So I think we're just going to go all the way around the circle and you just flip over the card and whatever the question is, you answer it and then you pass on to the next person. So I'm going to start with Vicky. Okay, here we go. What skills or social networks could you build now to depend less on money to meet your needs? <laughs> What skills or social networks can you build now? I am actually doing that in my hometown. I mean, we have a we have a network that helps people, a volunteer network that helps people stay in their homes, you know, age in place. We have volunteer networks that help the food bank. If I shop at the thrift store, then I'm putting money in the food bank, and later I get to take money out of the food bank, you know, take food out of the food bank. So actually, yeah, that's the thing. The social network I'm building is my community of place. And making that richer. Okay, take us shopping with you. Describe where you are, how you feel, what you buy. Actually, I don't really like shopping, so <laughs> most... <laughs> I never have. Somehow I don't know how it ended up in my, <laughs> my apartment. <laughs> no, but um, now is usually I go grocery shopping and um, I do make a li- list on Saturday. So I have this book where I write in what um, I want to cook over the week. And uh, so I, if I don't have time, I just copy another week. Um, but then I do make my shopping list in my cell phone and just go grocery shopping. Yeah, somehow, sometimes it ends up being a little bit more like potato chips or something. <laughs> somehow, mysteriously appear my grocery cart. Um, yeah, but the other part that I usually would uh, go to to buy stuff is um, outdoor gear. Um, but then usually I do have a purpose if I go in there and I don't come out with uh, any other stuff. Also, I managed to go to Ikea and come out with nothing. <laughs> What do you want for your children slash loved ones uh, that money can buy? So really for my daughter, I have a 10-year-old daughter, and um, the main thing I want for her to have is a safe, happy, healthy home. You know, that's the main one. And uh, that's right now my largest expense by a large, large amount uh, is to give her a good home um, and a you know good place to go to school and all that kind of stuff. So. All right, uh, I have I have two cards. The group doesn't know, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna flip them over and pick the best one because Fi's about making your own rules. Um, and so the first one is what values and beliefs um, do you bring to investing? And the second one is if you could take a year off work, how would you spend it? Um, I'm gonna go with the first one. What values and beliefs do you? Uh, bring to investing. And, and for me, I've found a, a lot of happiness in, in just living simply. And, uh, um, you know, I, I'm not a mental minimalist, I would say, by the the, the sense of uh, some of the people that, that I've seen online practicing minimalism. But, you know, there are some aspects of it that simplify my life. And so I personally have never uh, really had interest in investing pun intended. And um, so, you know, I, I was never interested in, in, in trading stocks and, and learning about um, companies in the stock market. And, uh, you know, Jim's book uh, completely, completely changed that for me because it's the simple path to wealth. And it's like he rewrote it right, right for me, you know. And so, um, you know, I, I uh, read his stock series twice and then I read his book twice. And I feel like I have 100 percent, literally 100 percent of the knowledge that that uh, I need to achieve FI and, and uh, continue on on this journey. Oh, this is an odd one. What is your life's work? (laughs) Well, if you'd have asked me 20 years ago, it would have been playing football forever, which is not possible. That's a really deep question to answer. (laughs) Brandon, you gave us about three weeks to work this one out. So uh, 90 seconds, I'm not sure. Um, I think the thing that's come out of this week when you speak to everyone is everyone wants to use the, the opportunity that FI gives them to fundamentally help other people whether that's reading to children in schools. Uh, my one, uh, I came up with it this week without the pressure of work and without having the giving me the space to think, possibly helping educate professional footballers, um, not to spend as much as they already do, but and also help disadvantaged children, you know, hard to reach people and that you can dedicate that time when you have the time to help other people. I think that's probably the best gift. Okay, so mine is, who or what would you trust to help you invest your money? Well, I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) Brandon, the mad scientist, and no one else ever. No, but... (laughs) 
and he knows this, he knows this. We've had the conversation. I actually stumbled upon the whole Phi thing through Brandon and through his podcast. And you know, and then I heard the podcast, and then I had the voice, and then I uh, read the blog, and then I'm like, oh, Jill and Brandon, oh, it's gonna be great. So. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely, this is a very good group to help um, that I do trust to help me invest my money. Whether or not there's a paradox here, because you come here and nobody tries to sell you anything. <laughs> so probably that's why you can trust them to help you invest your money. But yeah, it's a good group. Okay, so how do you economize on what? How do you feel about it? Uh, I, I've had a budget spreadsheet for about 10 years now. So, um, you know, back before I heard about FI, I was, I don't know, just probably a bit nerdy and, and just wanted to track my money in and out. Um, uh, uh, so I guess I, I, I don't ec economise on everything because I don't want to strip it back to the bare bones because I think I'd probably make myself miserable and have made my, myself miserable. So I think it's things like, um, uh, you know, like groceries, like Lena, you know, I'm, I do a meal plan every week. And then um, I, I have been known to have several tabs of all the different grocery stores and compare all the prices and then do some percentage variances uh, from time to time. Um, <laughs> uh, because, yeah, that's how it goes. So, yeah, I, I, and I just try and work out, every, you know, what makes me happy. So holidays, I probably don't economise on, you know, I try and use air miles, but they're not as good as the UK, uh, uh, sorry, the US credit card air miles. So we do what we can. But um I, I like holidays and they make me happy. So I'm not going to uh, economize specifically on that. But other things I do try and make sure that I optimize as much as possible. What did you want to be when you grew up? What about now? I remember and remember being told frequently um, that when I was in first grade and I went to school and, you know, somebody said, you know, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, oh, I, I, I want to be a teacher so I can be in school forever. <laughs> and because I just was such a little nerd and I just enjoyed so much about school and learning and just having all of that at your disposal. Um, and then for a while, I kind of wandered away from that. But but obviously, that's where I wound up now as a teacher. So now I, I am a teacher, but I've as I've shared with a couple people throughout the week, I've attempted to leave the profession several times over the last uh, 12 years or so. It is it is hard. And if you um, are a teacher or you know, have a teacher in close to you in your life, you've probably seen um, aspects of that. And there was a a blog post that I came across more than a few years back, I think it's by, um, she writes under the name Penelope Trunk, but the, the title of the blog was, don't do what you love. <laughs> um, you know, keep what you love as, as something on the side and then find something that makes you a lot of money. And for, for a short time, that really spoke to me because I was like, is this killing this thing that I love? It's so hard and finding the right circumstance is so difficult. Um, but I feel lucky now to be in a circumstance where I feel like, I'm enjoying what I do. And when we think about moving forward into FI, what that would look like is just doing it more on my own terms, um, being able to move aside the things about it that I don't like and keep the parts that I do um, and having that freedom. And the final card for me, uh, talk about one thing you own that you love and what do you love about it? So I'm going to do two because they're at the opposite ends of the uh, cost spectrum. Um, the first one is my MacBook Pro. I, like I said at the beginning, I love creating things and I can pretty much just create anything, including this podcast on this beautiful machine. And I love it so much, but that's a very expensive one. And the only other purchase I've made recently is one of those little cones that you can make coffee in that makes like the best coffee and it's the pour over coffee. And every morning I get up and it's like the best experience ever. And I fill my house with smells of coffee and then I drink one and it's the best and it's only like nine bucks or something. And it has brought me so much joy. We probably owned it for like a year or something already. And every time I go in there and I make my little pour over and make the bloom and then it, you know, bubbles and stuff. And then you pour over like in circles and it foams and it's like, it's the most amazing experience. So, so yeah, those two things. And that's bringing us to the end of it actually. And this has just been so fantastic. So thank you to all the participants. This has been amazing. Go around about what am I taking away from the conversation? Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's go around and, uh, say what you, you've taken away from your conversation and then we'll, I'll wrap it up. So Vicky. Yeah, I just loved this. I loved uh, watching these questions that I developed at home alone with a cat in my lap come alive, you know, in 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 your stories. 
and see how enlivening it is just to have that permission to talk about these sorts of things. So thank you all very much. I really enjoyed the cards and that we could talk a little bit um, and that it gave us some structure. And I think um, I never really talked to anybody about my plans. Some people know that I'm like a little bit financial nerd, but not that what I'm up to. So um, I think what I would take with me is that it's not that hard to start talking in, about money in general. So nothing, I don't want, my out, I want to out myself um, that I'm doing this journey at my job or something. It's just that I want to talk more about money in general. The thing that struck me is, as we were talking just before we got started was just all the different places everybody was from. Like this is a, this particular podcast is a lot less US centric than my typical reading and stuff. So that was one thing. And I'm going to take a cue from Brad in here and change the rules slightly and make a second answer too. Um, the other thing that really, I, I really pulled out of this and I've actually been thinking about this a lot as well. Um, is just the idea of how do we get this sort of teaching to people who aren't as well off? Cause a lot, all of us here probably have had some good advantages roll their way. You know, we had some good rolls of the dice when we started out um, one way or another, um, not to say that we haven't made good use of them, but, you know, to fully acknowledge that and how can we help, you know, pay it down, if you will, that sound, doesn't sound right. Whatever. Anyway, um, to help other folks out, uh, you know, especially people who aren't going to necessarily run into this on their own. So yeah, looking to help disadvantage and especially kids. The, the thing that uh, really spoke to me was that, you know, that it's criminal that we're not teaching kids about money better. It's just absolutely atrocious. And, you know, what, what we can do to make that better is definitely cool. Jason, I think that the, your last comment there about children is um, a couple people around the table here <clears throat> mentioned the the piece about children and financial literacy. And um, like I shared in the beginning, um, you know, I just thought you get your paycheck, pay the bills and spend the rest um, because I was never taught any different than that. And so I think it's really cool to hear like other people thinking about, yeah, like, you know, it, it's at that point, it's not necessarily like we need to teach children phi. It's like we just need to teach children about money and the value of money and, and how it's used and how it's not used. So um, I'm, it's really cool to see like other people really thinking about um, um, finances and children. Talking to a lot of people this week, I think a lot of people came to FI probably through Brandon's podcast. Um, and that's how they got start, started. I certainly did. But I think to a certain extent, the guests you interview, Brandon, Sometimes the audience is a bit like preaching to the choir. I think what we were talking about earlier is that the fact that we're all on here. We will then send it out to all our friends as bragging rights to say, listen to this, listen to this. And that could probably be one of the most powerful things that you're actually sending it to people who have no idea what this concept is. And just by definition, sharing it beyond its, its normal audience. I think um, the game is awesome. I think being able to talk about these things and having the diversity of questions is important. Uh, that is very good. But more than anything, it's important. The first thing we talked about was a financial mistake. And as we're going through the table, you see glimpses of recognition and acknowledgement on everybody's eye. So it means that we are all at the same place. We've all been in these places. Uh, so that is the important thing. It's a uh, a feeling that we share that is very mutual. Everybody has it. So bringing it there and bringing it out and being able to talk about it may be very uncomfortable at be in the beginning, but eventually we'll pay for it because you're really talking about something that people do understand. Uh, I think the big takeaway for me is um, how how things can change for the better when you when you take a bit of a risk and you have a few money. Um, <clears throat> so, sort of four months ago, I was sat on my uh, miserable tube journey to work, listening to the Mad Scientist, dreaming of the day I would be FI. Um, and and I had a few money, and and since then I've I've quit my job, I've gone part time, and now I'm actually sat with the Mad Scientist on a podcast <laughs> with the, with all these amazing people. So I think when you've got that financial sort of security, even if it's not FI, even if it's just a few money, you know. There's, there's so much cool stuff you can do. I think uh, for me, a big through line from this week has been um, values and how much you think about FI being about money and how much really for, for me, um, fairly quickly, it turned into a question of values. And because when you, as soon as you strip away this idea of not needing money and this, this very bare question of why are you here? What are you doing? What do you want? Um, for, for me, that was the most transformative thing with this journey is we I had a shout out to, to YNAB, to You Need a Budget, when we, that was our kind of first intro to all this of really having being held holding yourself accountable to living the life that you say you want 
to live. And that's been the most kind of transformative thing. And then throughout the week, you know, all the, the the speakers have been saying, well, you know, I'm not really talking too much about money in my presentation. And that's that's really been a through line of it's it's much bigger than that. So this conversation just highlighted the f- thing that I love most about the Chautauqua. It's like people come here for the presenters, presumably, but it's everyone that's here that has the knowledge and the experiences and the stories that teach everyone else so much. So like, I can't wait to listen back to this when I'm not actually like trying to orchestrate a podcast <laughs> and, and just like dive deeper into all the gems of knowledge that all of you have shared. And it's an incredible thing being here with all of you and meeting you and, and learning from you. And that's the thing that I don't think people expect is that like, you know, everybody's learning so much from everyone else. And that's the really the, the beautiful thing about this week. So I just want to thank all of you for being here. One for agreeing to do this talk and vicky thanks for putting this together and we're recording this in august of 2017 uh, but i'm hoping to release this in march of next year to coincide with the release of the you know the new version of your money or your life and i can't wait to read that new version um so presumably it's out and you can look in the show notes for a link to it but yeah thanks vicky for putting this cool game together this yeah the there's so much gold that came out of these discussions and uh, thank you all for being here.